desde sempre, talvez, <risos> eu trabalho com educação ainda. Assim, né? Já no INSPER, o meu estágio foi no instituto que trabalha com educação e segurança pública. Eu não sabia onde os estudos iam me levar, mas eu sabia que iam me levar longe. Trabalhei na Fundação Lehman, seis anos, é, dirigindo, liderando a área de pesquisas, e há dois anos eu fundei o IED, que é um slogan aí, interdisciplinaridade de evidências no debate educacional, que busca levar pesquisas e dados é, para os tomadores de decisão em educação. Depois de formada, o meu sonho era entrar no programa de treine do Itaú, e no segundo ano, em que eu estava prestando o processo, eu fui aprovada no treino especialista do Itaú BBA. Eu estou terminando o doutorado né, em educação. Minha visão é virar professor e contribuir para mudar a academia no Brasil. Eu estou na fase final do, do programa de treino. Agora o meu sonho é ser alocada em uma área que eu goste, fazer uma carreira de sucesso dentro do banco. E meu sonho também é poder adotar alguém como mentora, como madrinha, para o programa de bolsas e poder devolver ao INSPER tudo que eu recebi. Para a gente ter o Brasil que a gente quer, a gente precisa investir na educação. Então, hoje, é, não me vejo, acho que é impossível sair dessa área e acho que, na verdade, eu quero trazer mais pessoas para a área, porque a gente precisa muito. I don't know, you're, you're on mute. Oh, um abraço forte e leal, família Inspir. Estamos aqui com o Leite Cotley, professor Leite Cotley do MIT. É, e além, óbvio, ele tem um currículo gigantesco, aí quem quiser consultar ele, mas introduzindo rapidamente o professor Leite Cotley, o professor Fábio Dávila daqui do Inspir, o professor Paulo Amaral também aqui do Inspir. É, e a ideia hoje do no nosso bate-papo é discutir um pouco da inovação e dos contextos entre o Brasil e Estados Unidos, é, eu vou passar a nossa, a nossa conversa para inglês, é, então acho que a, a ideia agora, a partir de, desse momento, a gente mudar para inglês para conversar com o professor Blade. So, uh, thank you very much, professor Blade, it's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, it's a really, really great honor uh, so that you invited uh, this, uh, that you accepted this invitation, so uh, can you tell a little bit more about yourself and, and uh, explain the, the amazing things you do? <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks for having me on here. I appreciate this. Um, I have an interesting background in that I always wanted to create things for people that enhance their lives. So I, as an undergraduate in college, studied human factors, so engineering and psychology together, and worked uh, for 25 years in industry where I was working in different kinds of environments, all technologies, but with a really strong user experience component. So speech recognition technologies in the early 90s or mid 90s, late 90s, over to search and information access technologies. I did a whole bunch of other things since then, whether it's the first social robot for the home, um, where I ran design for that group or worked in cybersecurity and a, and a bunch of other things, including startups and big companies. And over those 25 years, I always also started teaching. So I've been teaching for the past 17 years or so in total. And that's given me a perspective that's a little bit different. So I've had to suffer working in industry where you have to figure things out and make it work, understand why it's not working and why it does work sometimes. I've also learned the academic side of what should be happening, how things should work based on a bunch of research. I've been able to pull the academics into the industry and the industry experience back to the academics. So I can teach from a position of having done it, knowing what it's like to do these things um, successfully and, and to also have failures uh, and to make that work. So it's given me a different perspective on the world. And so a few years ago, I started consulting and really consulting on what I teach. What I teach at MIT is about innovation, design thinking, and leadership, specifically for engineers. And by consulting like this, I help companies and organizations become more innovative because we've developed an assessment the world's first assessment that assesses innovation on the individual level, the innovation ability on the individual level of each person, and then gives trainings that very quickly in two and a half days enable them to become more innovative. Just right after that time period, they can start applying techniques immediately and then keep growing. So that's what I've been doing. 
So that's that's amazing. And uh, maybe for for the people who are watching uh, this for the first time and learning now uh, about design thinking and innovation, how could you define what is design thinking and what is innovation, so so people can understand a little bit sure. more. So these terms are kind of funny. Um, let's start with design thinking. Uh, design thinking is a term coined by IDEO back in the 90s, I think it was. And prior to that, we had user-centered design coming from like the 70s or 80s, became very popular. Um, and these concepts trace all, all the way back to like the 20s where people were thinking philosophically about what is it, how do we solve these problems that are complex? that are dealing with situations where there's uncertainty and people. And that's when we start getting a lot of this concept about we need a, a method, a structured method of solving these kinds of problems. There was a first thing published called Wicked Problems, I think was the name of it. And, and we see this term being used slightly differently every time. So we have user-centered design because people have forgotten to think about users explicitly. They said, uh, we'll make the solution. You told me what you want, I'll deliver something that does that. We, it does it, but people don't like to use it or they're having problems or they have failures and it's bad. You have to do better. Okay, so we're going to put users in the center. Then we had design thinking to say it's actually a you know, big encompassing term, not just user-centered design, but thinking about everything around it. And all this really is saying we need a structured way to solve really complex problems and, and in a way that people don't just know how to do. So we have a, a method and a procedure that anyone can follow, but... The more you do it, the better you get at it. And that's, I think, really what we mean by that term. Now, innovation is very specific. And people use it, they use it around a lot. They say, we want innovation. Or I think the Wall Street Journal published something this past year, and it was like top innovators, including Lewis Hamilton, the F1 driver. I'm like, I wouldn't call him an innovator. He might be, but not from what I saw. So when I take a look at this, you know, the term really is very simple. An invention is coming up with something new. And an innovation is creating value from that invention. Now, it could be economic value often, and it's economic value for companies, but it could be safety. If you're a military uh, organization, you create safety, security, certainty, um, any kind of value you want, as long as you're creating value. And the bigger the innovation, the more value you create in that context with an invention. That's it. Hi, Blades. I actually have a question to follow up on that. Did you actually see? Uh, change in culture and in procedure once the companies you worked with started to adopt this design thinking as opposed to only the user-centered approaches? Did you actually see change happen for the real uh, It's funny you say that. I, I don't know if it's a change compared to typical user-centered design. Um, most organizations, I think, there's a, a, just a slight difference, a slight difference that a nuance in the way that we teach it, the way that I think about it compared to the way that other people typically think about it. People talk when they're training professionals in business who are successful that they should focus on a few areas and often include things like creativity, like here's techniques for being more creative. Um, and they talk about things like empathy, um, very big concept. Uh, and they focus on users, like here, how do you get to know your users really well? And they work on, on concepts about uh, interviewing users and things like that. All these are good things to do. I don't focus on them, though, because what made a person who's successful in business, maybe they've been in business for 20 years, if they don't have empathy and they're still successful, I'm not going to teach them how to become more empathetic in two days. Um, so I don't focus on that. And... You know, creativity is, there's some very structured definition, which I agree with, which is pretty much what we teach, but often has an, a sense culturally that you have to be creative. You know, just an idea comes to you and you and you can just feel it. And you have to, you know, it has a, a, an idea that you're drawing wild pictures and all of a sudden, you know, the inspiration hits. And, and in that regard, we don't talk about things like that, but we do share techniques to help you, you know, here's a very structured way of thinking. Here's a way of bringing a team through an exercise in order to maximize that, sure. And we don't talk about users very much. We do, of course, talk about them. But we talk about them at the same weight that we talk about st other stakeholders. People forget that having a great idea um, is good and often can lead to great success. But the reason a lot of ideas at companies, that, which are great, don't 
yield successful results is because someone internally at the company blocks it. Um, so that's a stakeholder. Your user's a stakeholder too. So what you didn't get the thing to users because someone else blocked you. And we focus on that because a lot of times in organizations, they are trying to solve the problem for their users the best they can. And people don't try to block deliberately. They block because they don't understand it or they can't see the value and they haven't communicated effectively enough. So we focus on those kinds of elements a little bit differently. And yes, what I've, I've noticed that companies very quickly and organizations can have a cultural shift right from having the training. They become more, more aware of themselves, their own limitations. They understand the value of this process because the way we structure it to be used right away. And they see how leadership skills are necessary to combine with this to be successful in, in business or in any kind of organization. Without leadership skills, you aren't able to extract the innovation. You need to and have these, these without changing managers. And uh, so the training is across the board. Yes, for us, we will train from the CEO down to the intern. We, we think actually we, we see really good results when you get a mixed group from, from senior level, mid level, and junior level people together. That mixed group is a, uh, is a very important thing because then senior people can see how somebody who's very junior can come up with an idea that's very effective and can attack the process slightly differently. And a junior person can see what a senior person says and, and how they, they understand the process a little bit differently as well. And then they all align around the fact that you need to have this ability to come up with an idea, test it out, iterate on the idea. You're expected to challenge um, results. You're expected to ask questions. You're expected to iterate. That builds up really psychological safety in the kind of truest sense of the word in terms of how we mean as an academic environment. Psychological safety is exactly that sort of definition. Well, if I, if I may um, add a question here, Professor. Uh, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, my question is, uh, we, we are talking to students at 20 years old, and uh, they are probably going to face 50 years ahead of them. So my question is, what would you suggest to the students who are initiating their careers uh, about how they should deal with the transformations that technology will inevitably bring to their jobs? Uh, the context of this question came in a conversation with a psychologist, 25 years old, and how their job, and you have some experience in that field as well. How can they prepare to survive in the worst case scenario or to take advantage or even better to lead this transformation, given that they was going, they're going to work for 50 years and uh, no one can imagine the transformation they're going to have in 50 years? Yeah, it's a great question. That's a great question. Um, here's how I think about that. Uh, things don't really change that much. Some things change a lot, but the underlying things don't change much. So, you know, we have a, we've had one fundamental massive shift in our lives, which is the smartphone by and specifically the iPhone. Um, because we have this intersection that happened. It was an, an amazing moment of data. You can get data from anywhere. You have this, so you have mobile technology now. You have the processor and the screen, everything else. You have this incredible interface that can shift and change. You have an interaction which is very, very natural and directly manipulative. And the iPhone, because of the iPhone's invention, uh, it shifted hours of how people spend their lives. In about two and a half years, we could take we could look at the graphs. Um, that one shift has been the most dramatic shift in the world. And as you see, everything is happening because of that, whether it's Twitter or Uber or Airbnb or Netflix, everything else is shifting because of this kind of technology. Because of that, we need to be sensitive to how you need to, as a student, be aware of how um, the same thing will happen over and over and over again. You know, you'll uh, Uber is a two-sided marketplace, right? And and we have Airbnb, a two-sided marketplace. And so what's happening here? Well, if we look back, we look for models. And the model here is this is this one device, right? This one incredible object that connects people at incredible speeds to each other like that. And there's organizations centered around that. Now, that's not a new concept, though. We've had two-sided marketplaces in the past. That's called like a real estate agent is a two-sided marketplace. Like, I need a place to live. Great. And I need to sell or, or rent a place. Okay, so they're the, still the same thing. That model has existed beforehand. What's different now is 
what the, this technology enables you to do on top of that with ratings, things in real time, 3D, VR, all that stuff. So I think the thing is to, as a student, read a lot about different things that are true 100 years ago and think about how they're still true now. People have underlying needs they're always trying to solve for. How to, how to, how to live in terms of a, a healthy life, how to have fun, how to learn, how to be loved, how to control their environment, how to understand their environment. Like it's some basic things that people do. And so philosophy, psychology, things like that are really important for students to learn about because the, the underlying things don't change. Um, you know, if, if you can take classes that share concepts about certain kinds of models, business models, like, you know, um, how, what, a, what a platform is, um, a technological platform, what that means, or understanding two-sided marketplaces, things like that. Those kinds of simple models, once you understand them, you can see them everywhere. Um, and I think that for a student to be prepared for the future, it's the, the, the changes might look, there might be lots of, lots of things happening, but at the core, things don't change too much uh, over time. And I think that by focusing on the core, by challenging the underlying assumptions built into everything that they see, they're going to see the patterns repeat themselves over and over again and look for those repeating patterns. Um, particularly after you've been out of school for about 25 years, you'll see the pattern happen several times and you're like, oh, that was the same kind of thing that happened 20 something years ago, but a little different and now doing it again. You know, in 2000, they were doing, you know, delivery services because it was dot com and people had had, you know, exuberance. And they said, yeah, we'll just deliver things and there'll be no fee for it. And you want a candy bar, we'll bring it right to your to your door. We're like, wow, it just I can type something into my computer and we want a, a compact disc and a candy bar and some popcorn. It just came. Um, but the business didn't work because they couldn't figure out how to make it make sense economically. And, and then the dot com bust and everything failed. What's happening now? Delivery services are back. And are they successful? I don't think they're economically successful. So what do they do instead? Maybe they're selling data, maybe doing something. I don't know what they're doing, but it's a, it's a tough business, but it's back. So the cycle repeats itself. So if you saw what happened the first time, you're prepared better for the next cycle. It's just like disco, disco. If you take a look at uh, the killers, the killers, one of their albums, I think their second album has a lot of disco sounds to it because it's, it's going to keep coming back. Absolutely. I really like this idea of understanding history to actually see where we are, because often as students, we know that we think everything is solved. And then mm -hmm. once you start to actually see what's underlying, we see we're only scratching the surface and actually that's the source of innovation. Right. Yes. But, you know, as an educator, you know, who, we're always thinking about teaching methods and trying to help the students to learn how to learn. So that's yeah. a motor that's often used. Yes. But often we don't know all the key ingredients to actually, for example, creating psychological safety, not only in companies, but also for the students who want to innovate yeah. to actually have this confidence and then to follow yes. uh, on this path. So in your experience, do you know, like you have some key methods that could be also used in a teaching context as opposed to in a, in a company context? In a, so in a, in a teaching context to help students gain more confidence? Yeah, and, and have these psychological safety to yeah. actually go on and be prepared to, to take the challenges they will face. Yeah, well, so, so psychological safety, let, we'll break it down in a couple of different categories. I think there are, and I, I believe, and I, and I teach for this, there are three components of, uh, that, that yield a successful innovation environment. The first one is having the skills to be innovative. So that means I understand a, a design process, you know, a research design test iterate and I have some depth and understanding of some of the elements there. The, uh, and along with that is the leadership skills that you need to be able to have that design process to be able to be executed um, completely. I think there's, there might be some noise going from your environment, but there we go. Thank you. Um, having the ability to execute that design with others. That's the leadership skills of advocacy. How do you advocate for your idea in a way it's effective? Not just tell someone about it, advocate because the first thing the skills you need some skills the second thing is you need the confidence to use the skills so i might have learned how to do it and i might have done it once am i confident that i can be successful i do it at work for example if i do it tomorrow if i do it when i'm planning a, a birthday party the more you do it the more you develop some confidence and that's the second component so you need confidence because we know that and we call it self-efficacy the more you believe you'll be successful with things like being innovation, being innovative or 
being an entrepreneur, the, there's a super high correlation that you will actually be more successful. So self-efficacy is really important. And the last component is psychological safety. And that's a group thing. That's in my context of my group. Do you, is it okay to challenge results? Is it okay to ask questions? Is it okay and expected? I'm going to iterate towards a solution. I don't need to know the answer at the beginning. If it is, I have psychological safety. And if a really talented, successful person goes into the wrong team that doesn't believe that, the psychological safety goes way down. And so that's the question. Do you have leadership skills to then bring it back up or not? And that can be very hard uh, at the beginning. But those are the three components. You need to have some basic skills, the confidence to use them in an environment where it's good to be used. And that's why I, I never think students could graduate and join an environment just because it pays a lot or because it's prestigious. They got to go with a group that they want to actually be with where they feel like they, they can be their best selves. And people say you, you should be with a group so you can grow more. There's different kinds of growth. Some growth is that was really bad and I learned what I don't want. That's useful, but don't do it for too long. The other growth is I can be successful and grow to become um, better because there's psychological safety in that environment. So uh, you, you said uh, a lot about uh, technology, uh, psychological safety. That's really, really important. So regarding that, I have two small questions. One is how can we uh, teach the students who basically are uh, teenagers or going into the, the uh, adulthood uh, in the beginning of college or in the end of college, I don't know. How can we teach them to have the psychological safety because they are really shy and how can, uh, I mean, they, they share a lot with the, with their colleagues, but they don't want to be uh, mocking or, or, or something like that. And the second one is basically regarding your uh, other question uh, is Professor Christensen from Harvard had this concept of uh, job to be done. Oh, yeah. Do you think that that's the idea you, you, you were talking about? And, and do you think we have a lot more to be discovered what is your opinion about that yeah sure okay let's let's go to the first one what was the first question, part of the question it was it was about so how, how can we teach students, students yeah. yeah yeah so there's you know it needs to, there's two things um uh, students will develop psychological safety in an environment where they feel like they're supposed to do these things but that's not enough um what i think you're really talking about is courage having courage that is a skill to have courage is a skill so when i was a child I asked my mom a question. I, know, I was four years old or something. Maybe I was five. And I wanted to know something about, was, did, that, did that toy store have the toy or something? I don't know what it was. She said, call them. I'm like, call them? Yeah, call them. I was so anxious, nervous to call them. And then eventually I called them and I nervously and, and it was okay. And then I was, the next time I called, I was a little bit less nervous and eventually I became fine. And then I called way too many things. Um, I gained confidence. Because uh, I was courageous to do the thing I was too anxious to do, did it anyway. What I think has happened now, because of this one magical device, is that people don't want to have conversations. They don't want to talk. They they will text. They'll look at their phone, but they won't have a conversation. And I think because of that, it's really bringing down people's ability to develop courage, because they often hide behind their communications. Um, and to be able to communicate an unpopular opinion is important, but just to be able to communicate and say, I'm thinking this, or I've got a question for you, um, or in a classroom when a teacher asks a question to say something um, is really, really important. And that's a skill that, that, that comes back to a student. I don't know that a teacher can, can make students feel more courageous, except by cold calling on them, right? Their name, you have their names right in front. You said, Susan, what do you think? And when Susan says something that's really off base, you say, not quite, and, I'm, and thank you for contributing, and, and they get points for contributing. It's like, great, they can, or they can say, I don't know. I had a, I did get a, a note from a, a student's advisor saying, oh, uh, the student told me that you cold call on the students. Um, and she's too, she's very anxious about that. and doesn't want to be cold called. I'm like, well, what, you expect me to remember, first of all, there's 90 students. I'm not gonna remember which one it is. I, I'll try, but I'll, I probably won't remember. And I won't remember at the moment when I'm in the middle of teaching and when I, when I want to get different opinions. Um, but the student, you could arm them by telling the student to say, I don't know. Let me think about it. And that'd be a fine response. Um, and also, I'm very nice about it. So I'm not going to be, you know, you have failed because you didn't do it. So you have to build a little bit of that up as a teacher. But students can't be sheltered. 
Um, and they shouldn't shelter themselves. So if it's a student who's listening to this, if you are anxious about being cold called in class, then you should tell the teacher to call on you because then you won't be anxious. You'll be like, okay, I told the teacher to call on me. If they call on me, I don't know. I'm just going to say, I don't know the answer to that one. And you're, you're going to be thinking, and but you'll have the courage to say that and you'll realize it's okay to say that. Um, but that comes down to, I think, a lot of these things where people, you know, students getting on the phone with a student or, you know, having a, having a 20 year old make a phone call, it's a very stressful thing for them. They should do it more often and develop that courage. That's what they students need to have courage. As far as Clay Christensen's Jobs Be Done framework, so I think it's an interesting framework, but I don't like the way it's used. How about that? So they did some analysis. They said, look, what's a job be done of a Dyson vacuum cleaner versus the job be done of a, I don't know, a different kind of vacuum cleaner? And they concluded uh, that people think that the job be done is really about if I'm rewarding myself after a big project, house renovation, I get the nice vacuum cleaner to reward myself. Um, and there's some interesting things where they ask some people, what's the job be done? And people can kind of think in a different perspective. Oh, th that serves this purpose. That can be useful. It's a useful technique for getting people to think from a different perspective, to see things from a different perspective. I think that's where it's useful. But I think people use it as a crutch to describe something that happened in the past, but doesn't give them information about the future. So that's so there's I think there's a good aspect about saying to a person, what would you describe that that what is what's that job? What what job does it do for you? And they tell you something because they can think a little bit differently. But I don't like the way people use it to say, ah. If the job you've done for that thing was that, then we're going to make this thing this job and we're going to make it work this way. It doesn't, I don't think it works that way at all. Um, but I do think that you have to understand what makes the thing the thing. What makes a, a fork a fork uh, is a tough question to answer. If you said to someone, what makes a fork a fork? Because you, when I tell you to pick up the fork, you never pick up the knife by accident. You never pick up a spoon by accident. You know what makes a fork a fork. Well, they'll say, it has, you know, these, these things, they're called tines. I said, great. So if I have, if I have two tines, is that a fork? I said, well, yeah. So I'll draw a picture of these two tines like that far apart. And like, oh no, you'd have a handle too. Okay, now I'll draw a handle, but and the tines need to be closer together. How close? Like this close? No, 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 they need to be far apart. Okay, so we start getting into how far apart and close, how many? One, two, one doesn't work because the, the food can spin. Two keeps it from spinning. What's the job be done? You can translate food in space. I can I can pick it up and eat it from different perspectives, right? Um, a spoon doesn't do that. You, you move the spoon and things fall. Um, forks do a lot of things. But when you get down to it, it's like, well, each tine has to be not too wide, but not too narrow. If you, we don't know what makes a fork a fork, how do we know what makes a cell phone a cell phone? Like these are things that you have to really understand with some depth to them. And I think that, that it is really important to think about what is the underlying human need that this thing addresses, and then in what context. So um, if I ask Alexa to play some music, what needs addressing? Well, it's a need for me to control my environment. I need to control, control my environment, remote controls, speech, buttons, um, whatever. I control my environment all the time, right? Um, and in this case, it's the context is using voice and music. In that context, I'm controlling my environment, right? So if you understand the underlying need you're starting to solve for, then you can start projecting out. Okay, well, it's music with voice. I could shift it to become news with voice, or I could shift instead of voice with a, with a, with a keypad or with buttons or something else to get the music to start. So I'm thinking in a structure, a more architectural way. So I'm thinking about what you just said uh, about the, the voice commands and, and this area where you, you have been a pioneer in, in different roles. And I'm now thinking in terms of research and uh, how it often helps inspire people to be on the beginning of something and then to see something grow. Uh, and then my question is, how do you see the importance of basic research for institutions who want to innovate? You know, it's something that's often you know, downplayed as opposed to more applied research. You see that in, in grant funding and calls and 
But do you see as a fundamental thing for an institution to want to have a sustainable long-term innovation culture to also have basic research? Yeah, I mean, I think the basic research is super important. It's you, what basic research really is, is getting down to the core of what makes a fork a fork. And that's, you know, in whatever environment you're talking about, whether it's material science or, or user experience, it doesn't matter. But whatever you're thinking about this, like what makes the thing the thing? How does it really work? You know, what, what, what's happening at the atomic level? What's happening at the, you know, the human level with psychology or whatever it happens to be? You need that because that in, insights that come from that propel higher order insights, applied research, propel higher order abilities to make a product that, that changes the way people live their lives in the, in the world. So you need to have all three. If you just start taking what exists and recombining it this way, that's not useful. It doesn't tell students what to do. It doesn't create an environment that grows over time um, because you're just, you're just mixing and matching existing things. It's like making um, uh, a, uh, what's it called? like a quilt, right? Like I, I have a few pieces of, of, of material, I stitch them together. That's fine and it's good, but for an institution, you need to get back down to the, to the essence. You need all three levels there. And I think students need to be aware of that because every time they want to do an innovation, they have to, in their own way, think about the basic elements of what makes something special. Every company does this that's successful. I mean, particularly a company like Apple, for example, they're going to do something, they're going to get down. They, they one time had, when they came out the watch, they had a video they made about the watch materials and they made a gold watch. And they said, our metallurgists basically took gold and made it more gold. And they took it, they cooked the gold, took it apart, all the stuff that wasn't gold and gold, they put different stuff in to make it more scratch resistant and stronger. Um, and that's amazing. Uh, they're like, we made gold better. Okay, that's, get your head around that. They're doing that in a very quick way though, that becomes, you know, in, in the hands of customers. But even, you know, Apple was taking a look at things for, in 1987, they come out with a video called Knowledge Navigator about this guy that has basically an iPad looks different uh, with a big giant um, uh, camera lens on it. Um, and he's talking to this figure that's on the computer and he's doing a video call and all this stuff, 87. So think about all the basic research they're doing at Apple and leveraging university stuff, everything that's happening that they can do in order to come out with an iPhone in you know, 2007. That's years before that. So I think that institutions need to be able to do that. And it's really important. Professor, uh, how companies, uh, especially the ones uh, outside the tech space, and some of them in desperate need of a digital transformation or at least a digital migration, can attract talents or raise capital in a scenario in which the general perception is that uh, you can only find good jobs in the tech space? Well, and uh, a good example of that is the very high demanding market for software engineers and developers sure uh, which also became a global market after the pandemic well there's a lot into that question i mean so let's you you, you brought the term digital transformation this is an important term um and i'll make it clear for, for students when people when people talked about this term recently and i thought kept thinking a few years ago I kept, i'm like why are we talking about digital transformation haven't we been doing that since and the ATM came out in the 60s. I think it was 1968 in London. Barclays had the first ATM. I, the, I don't even think there was a pin code. I don't know what they did. But the, um, um, but that's been digital transformation constantly. Well, what people realize now is that there are certain processes they want to make more digital. Okay, um, A lot of it is actually called robotic process automation. And basically you're saying what people do currently with their whatever systems they use we're going to take people out of the equation and we're going to make it all automatic. And the trouble is it's cumbersome. It often breaks because the rules aren't fully understood about what people do and they make these systems. And that's, that's something that's not very valuable, unlike real digital transformation and real digital transformation is using these technologies now, like, you know, understanding IOT devices, better 3d printing, uh, machine learning uh, technologies, combining those in really interesting ways that fundamentally shift the business. So for example, if you're a, uh, an airline and you need parts um, for your airplane because there's something breaks, you 
can't store all the parts for all the different configurations of all the planes in your airline, in your warehouse. You just don't have all the, all the space for that. So what do you do? You call up the company to order a part. And there's a lot of assumptions baked into the, how this has to happen that people haven't challenged for a long time because a company who knows about aeronautical engineering makes this part and it's expensive to make the part because they have the tooling is expensive to manufacture it. And then they ship the part to you. That takes a while to manufacture and ship and for you to get it into the plane. Okay. Robot, robotic process automation doesn't help there. Maybe it speeds some things up, but true digital transformation means I want to have that part in my plane right away. I don't want it to be shipped over because it takes too long. And I don't want to have to store all the various parts. So I'm going to manufacture them on site in a little small building. How do I do that? 3D printing for aerospace engineering. And now they can do it. Now that requires lots of data, lots of technologies, a lot of ability to make sure you can make high quality parts there. But all of a sudden, you fundamentally shift the way that company does business. That is digital transformation. Now, any organization, every organization, every uh, organization, but every sector will go through this digital transformation, no matter what it is. Some a little bit more aggressively at the beginning than others, but it doesn't matter what industry you're getting into. But as we become more knowledge workers and more technologies being leveraged for this, yes, you can be a software engineer, you could be a hardware engineer, you can be a psychologist, you can be, do a whole bunch of things in any kind of organization. But every company is going to go into a stronger um, uh, environment where the where the organization fundamentally shifts or needs to shift because someone else will take the business away from them if they don't. Um, but every industry will do this. So I think that students can go into any industry they want to um, and should because they're attracted to the industry, but but they should be attracted to the opportunity in front of them to have a certain kind of impact. And if they want to have impact because of, of um, having better uh, green technologies or they want impact because they want people to feel better about themselves, whatever it happens to be, they should go into those, but they will all need to understand how these technologies will transform every, every industry. And, and in regarding how the, the company can attract these talents, uh, what do, do they need to project to the students, to the nope. students out there? Yeah. To if bring they, them in. It's a great question. Um, the company needs to be honest with, with the students because a company that is really wanting to do digital transformation, no matter what they're in, they will say, yes, we're in an industry that looks boring. I don't know what that industry is. I don't want to make fun of anyone in the industry, but let's say, oh, insurance doesn't seem very exciting. I'm sure it is exciting if you're in insurance. I don't know a lot about insurance. So if you're in insurance, I apologize. Um, but it's it doesn't seem very exciting, maybe to some students. Maybe to, to me, it wouldn't be. Um, but if they said, look, we want to do digital transformation in our insurance industry, because we want to revolutionize the way insurance is done. They're going to be, they're going to already have a strategy involved in place, share the strategy with the student. That would be very exciting because the students don't have to be attracted to, you know, a, a shiny object. The students are smart enough to know that if you work at a really exciting sounding company, but a really boring job, it's going to be way worse than with a boring sounding company, but with a really meaningful job. And so they need to share their strategy, but most organizations that say they want to do digital transformation or they want to change the industry, they don't necessarily know how to do it. They don't really, they want to have, they want to do it, but they don't really feel it. And if they don't have a good strategy in place, then whatever the representative of a student won't be very exciting. So I think that, that the way they attract students is by openly sharing their strategy and by coming up with a really good strategy. Um, I've seen companies like John Deere, you know, when I first thought about tractors, I thought, oh, that sounds kind of boring. And I learned about John Deere. I'm like, wow, you're super cool. They innovate constantly and they're an amazing company. And I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I would want to work for them because they really care about the innovation. So I I think when I've, I've seen this happen so many times where a company that sounded like an old brand or an old thing that I wouldn't find interesting, when I find out what they're actually doing, it's very, very cool. And other companies that sound really cool and I find out what they're actually doing, I'm like, ooh. That doesn't sound very fun at all. Where, where's the fun part? Uh, no, that sounds like that sounds like suffering. 
well now to connect you know this this topic to the previous one we talked you know i want to know what's your experience on actually having diversity in companies this is a very important topic in brazil sure. because we also are a very diverse society yep. and i and of course there's a lot of attention on that nowadays yes there is and in your experience do you actually see that actually being a factor that does improve ideas generation and then maybe even representing stakeholders within the own company without necessarily having to experience experiment yeah. so much with users early on in particular yeah. in your experience do you see that then does that also provide a little bit of psychological safety for people who otherwise could be uncomfortable being like in real minorities it's a, it's a great question it's a great question now i'm going to answer this pretty completely if i can um because it's a hot topic and um and i think it's an important one is there do you get benefit from having diverse um experiences uh having a team with diverse experiences absolutely the most important diversity is diversity of thought i believe in a team trying to innovate now where does that diversity of thought come from it can come from a personal experience they come from the fact that you grew up in a certain environment come from the fact that you were uh, a, an actual a minority of, of some sort uh, that we've identified, or it could be something else. There's a lot of things that give diverse experiences um, to a group. And you don't always, there's no one person with one identity represents the whole group. Um, there's, Cause there's, there's lots and lots of nuance here. Um, and so does diverse backgrounds enhance uh, innovation? Absolutely. Does only if the diverse backgrounds contribute to diversity of thought. Um, does it bring up psychological safety? No, I think it lowers psychological safety because people are afraid to say things for fear of offending someone in the group. So it actually reduces psychological safety at times. Like I want to challenge that result. And someone says, you can't challenge that because I'm, I'm representing that group. And that's what's happening a lot in, in environments. It, it can't happen a lot in environments. So it can be it can be tension provoking for someone because they don't want to challenge someone about their experience, not about their experience, about what they're representing, um, what they what they believe. Um, so that can be difficult, and it requires people to actually know how to work better and communicate better, requiring more coverage. Again, um, so diversity of thought is important, and you will get that from a diverse, diverse backgrounds as well. Um, it's uh, really critical that you can do that. But there's a, another side of this, which is you can't have every human being on your team. You can't have everyone represented on your innovation team. You just, they can't be that big. So at what point do you start bringing it down to say, well, here's what we do need, what we don't need. Now, if you were developing a product and you have no appreciation for the groups of people you're developing it for, you need to learn. Now you can learn by bringing someone in or you can learn just by doing research there. If I have to develop a product for someone in Brazil, I've never been to Brazil. I don't know what it's like. I don't speak uh, Portuguese, so I, I can't, I don't you know. Try. I'd, I'd like to try. I'd like, I'm, I'm going to start with uh, with um, uh, uh, music. I think, uh, um, what was, what's it? Uh, Gilberto Gil? João Gilberto, Gilberto Gil. Yeah, okay. well. um, so I'd start there. Um, but I don't know what it's, I don't know what it's like to be there. Now, if I, was making a product for a Brazilian environment, um, I would probably want to hire someone, bring it onto, onto my team because they're going to know about the cultural experiences there a little bit. They won't know everything though. And they might make mistakes the way that I'd make mistakes if I launched a product in the US where I didn't realize that someone, some group of people didn't understand this or like this. I need to have that kind of understanding. It's important because it's explicitly made for them. But what if I don't have someone who's left-handed on my team and we're developing a product that you use, we might make a mistake and we're going to learn from it by iterating over time. Or I can realize that I have a checklist in my head. Does it work for right-handed and left-handed people? Does it work for colorblind people? That's a big one people forget. But once you build up a certain set of skills, I don't need to have a colorblind person on my team. There are tools I can use to see, or and guides and, and best practices. So I can learn about that, right? Um, Eventually, as a team, we grow our knowledge, but we're never, ever going to be complete. So do I need to have people on my team from those groups? Maybe, depending on what I'm doing. Will diverse opinions in, enhance our ability to come up with more 
ideas that are valuable? Certainly. But where do those, those ideas come from? It's diversity of thought and, and your experiences can contribute to that, but not just your experiences that you've had because of your background. So I think that it's, when you, depending on what you're doing, you can choose your, your mix. Because, I mean, how big is a team that's going to innovate together? Five, 10, 15 people, 20 people who are really leading the innovation? That's not many people. That's not enough diversity of human beings to get you know, representational samples there. That's okay. You can create things and then you learn by giving it to lots of people and asking what their thoughts are and observing them and doing ethnographic research. And then you iterate and you iterate and you iterate to be aware that you may not make a, as a guy, a, a sexual, a successful product for a woman to be aware of that is important because then you could say, I'm going to launch it. I'm going to ask you what you think about it. They'll say, I don't like it for this reason. Like, Oh, I never thought about that. Well then let me, let me make it better. Um, I think it's by having the openness to be ready to make those changes. No one expects you to get it right out of the gate, but to be willing to make the changes that you think are valuable and necessary because you're willing to open your ear and your, your mind to a different experiences that are relevant and valuable. Professor, uh, in the courses that you teach about innovation, uh, what is the, the single most relevant concept that your students must acquire? And what do you do to make sure they get it? The, the most important thing is to have students challenge the underlying assumptions of everything. Um, you know, students at great universities like MIT and Tufts where I've taught and every other place I've seen, you know, they got there because they were very, very, very good at doing a few things. Often they were very good at taking a problem that was given to them and solving it. So when they were kids, they might've said to their math teacher, why are we learning to take the area, to find the area of a circle? And maybe the math teacher gave them a good answer, but most of the time they didn't. And they probably weren't trained to challenge why they were learning something. Instead, what they got is homework. And they did so well in their homework, they got good grades. Because they got good grades, they moved to more advanced material. Because they did so well at that, they got into a good university. Now, at the good university, their freshman year, they were given a problem to solve. And they solved it. And they got good grades again. And they went up all the way through until they took on harder and harder challenges. And they went into business. And their first job, the first job out of school, what do you do? Well, we'll give you a problem to solve. And they go, great. And then they saw it. They did so well, they get a promotion after eight months. In this process, a lot of people don't challenge why they're doing what they're doing. And if you don't challenge the underlying assumptions built into this, you won't innovate. You'll just be good at solving problems that were given to you. So the most important thing we work on is challenging the underlying assumptions in everything. Look at cameras. If you look at a, a big camera, what's the assumption? That you have to look through this little viewfinder and put this camera to your head and I turn my head this way, like I have to turn my head. Why? Because my nose is in the way. I can't put the camera here. My nose is in the way. Because old cameras had film, and the film had to be on a flat plane. And so I couldn't put my face that close to the camera. But new cameras don't have to do that. I could, I could have a cutout for my nose, and I could bring it in. There's a lot of ways you can get around that with a new camera, digital technologies. But we don't do that. And when you start challenging all the assumptions about making a better camera, you become a company like GoPro who's innovated tremendously, continuously. Everyone said, ah, GoPro, they're gonna make a few GoPros and they'll be out of business. But they keep staying in business, how? Well, GoPros, you know, people use selfie sticks and you see the, the camera looks back. They said, huh, there's an assumption that the, that the image has to have everything that was in the image, like a selfie stick. They said, let's erase that. And you have a, a video of people who are doing things like snowboarding and it looks like there's a camera following them because they've digitally erased the selfie stick. That's incredible. And if you don't know how to challenge the underlying assumptions in everything you do, you can't, you can't innovate. So we work on practicing that skill to give problems and then see if they challenge it naturally or not. And then we give them more opportunities to have problems given to them to see if they challenge it. This is the most important skill to learn if you want to innovate. I absolutely agree. And coming from a scientific background, this is absolutely quintessential for, for science. You know, yes. 
And I, I also like the title of our event today, which is Life is Innovation. Yes, and uh, and and I see it in, in in many ways. You know what this is. I'm I'm actually a biologist, so I I'm very interested in evolution and see how nature creates solutions to problems that we, for example, here in an engineering school, are always looking at. But I feel that sometimes you know we don't step back mm -hmm. and then give room for creativity to actually observe nature. And my question is maybe as a cliche question, you know, but if you look. That, you know how fast-paced things are nowadays and how much time we spend looking at screens do you think it's it's important to to have also as teachers and companies giving space for people to actually stop and think and maybe even having a time of creative leisure outside of those creative spaces within the company you know so how do you see that as as an actual actionable yeah I think there's, you said, you said a, a few words that you said to give people the opportunity. And I think it needs to be more than that. You need to require and create the opportunity for that to happen. Um, you need to actually create the experience. So, you know, there used to be a lot of kind of corporate events where people would have um, a trip to a climate, you know, a warm place if you're in a cold place or something else. And you're all together and you do activities over the course of the day and people expect to be off their phones, stuff like that. And then they have dinners and people talk at the dinner table and they have drinks and food. And then you have COVID that comes and everyone's like, well, we're not meeting in person anymore. And it's coming back now. Conferences are coming back. If, you, if you're at a conference and you are getting something meaningful out of it, you're attending the sessions. You're, you're, you're listening. You're being quiet. You're not on your phone. You have to, you have to absorb the material. And if you're responsible for, re, for recording it so that you can say, here's what I learned at the conference, you have to network with people and say hi to people having courage to say hi to strangers and talk with them. And then you have dinner with people and you're connecting and you're thinking about objects, you're talking about ideas and you're talking about the concepts that you experienced. All of a sudden you're not on your phone anymore. You are having an opportunity to, to let those thoughts kind of go in the background and to bring some other thoughts to the foreground. And that's really, 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 really valuable. Uh, and so I think companies need to create that and they can do it by having internal conferences. We're like, yeah, we're all going to be having a conference. It's going to be at the, this um, a, a hotel down the street. They'll be from 9 in the morning to 5 p.m. Then we have uh, drinks and we have dinner. And they make the conference fun and interesting for people to go to. And they make the sessions educational, different perspectives from different people. Companies do this kind of, used to do this all the time. But by doing that sort of event, people internally can think differently and communicate with different people than they would normally because they're going to be recombining different sessions. And having dinner where it's even more relaxed, that's really, really important. And they're off their screens and they're off thinking about the thing that needs to get done today. They need to think about more long-term ideas. And this is when you have people come in and show an environment about what's happening in these trends. You know, if you if you make if you're trying to figure out what kind of food to serve on an airline, you know, that the companies that pr provide the food will give you a trend report. Here's what's important about food in the world. Here's what people are doing about food in the world. Here's how we can map to those trends that people value who are flying first class or business class or something else. And those trend reports are very illuminating and they get a lot of information distilled for them in a valuable way. They take the time to think differently. I think that kind of stuff can be really, really valuable. Any corporation can do it. It's pretty easy to do. And the, the long-term return is so valuable. People like the environment better. They like getting to other people you know, that they work with differently. They are still thinking about work, but in different ways. It doesn't feel like it's, you know, like they're doing something that's, mm, they might be uncomfortable with, you know, where they're trying to do bonding exercises and like, I don't want to do that sort of bonding thing, but they're actually bonding because they're talking about some ideas that relate to their work that they all agree to come to because that's what they do for work and then have time to get to know each other socially a little bit differently without being communicating like this. Great. Uh Thank you, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we are getting to the end of the, the this this uh, webinar. I'm sorry, it has really great, interesting points. I, I, I could keep going for two or three hours. That, that is really awesome. Maybe we can do that another time, or, or maybe we can discuss a little bit more about all the ways to collaborate between uh, our university and, and, and your company or even MIT. Yes. So that that's really great. I would thank you. 
thank you very much, Fabio and Paulo, for uh, their presence here yes. and for the, the questions. It was really great questions. And I also would like to thank the Innovation Hub from, from our university, from Innsbruck University, uh, that is seeking for these opportunities to connect uh, really amazing people like, like you, Professor Blade, and, and the students and the, the people from the university uh, around. So uh, if you'd like to say something uh, in this end, uh, feel free to, to, to add any comments you want to. This is, this is uh, I, I love this sort of thing to be able to connect the dots to different kinds of students and different people, different universities, different environments. I, the, the last thing I think I, I may leave you with is often people who aren't living in, you know, in Silicon Valley think, oh, I can't innovate that much because I'm, I'm geographically somewhere else. And, you know, I was talking to some kids up in Wales and they're like, ah, we don't know if we can really do it. We're so basically we're so far away from all that stuff that's happening, um, or they think they need money. They're, they're, we don't, they don't have much money. There there aren't any barriers anymore. If you if you can watch this thing because you have a computer in front of you, you you have everything you need. You just need the skills, and you can learn a lot of skills online um, as well. But you have some leadership skills and some some skills for being able to be a good innovator and inventor. And together that will that will shift your ability to execute. You don't you can do it anywhere in the world. There are the, the limits are so low. Uh, now that that if you want to hap make it happen, it, you can make it happen. Um, and I love being able to, to work with people in different environments to for them to realize that they have within themselves all this incredible talent that you can they can they can unleash if they want to. I think that's a great tangy. Thank you. It's a real honor to speak with you all. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, for opportunity. So, guys, uh, if you are watching uh, after a while this video, so click here in the in the subscribe button. And, and also, we have the captions if you don't speak a little uh, uh, English. So add the captions here so you can uh, enjoy this conversation. It's a pretty good conversation. So thank you very much, Professor Blade. And, and talk to you soon, I hope. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Blade. Thank Bye, you. everyone. See you. Bye-bye.